So as you all know, uh, Latin America is facing some very specific, specific problems. And now the question will be answered by Agostino Fontevecchia, who's the digital director, editorial perfil in Argentina, um, how uh, a situation in Latin America can be faced. Well, hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Agustino Fontevecchia. I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about um, the situation with the publishing and innovation in Latin America, where our troubles and our stuff is very different from what you see over here. So when one traditionally thinks about innovation, the first thing that comes to mind is software, of course. We think of Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs. But I think the problem with that is that we often confuse cause with consequence or symptom with cost for that matter. Because Microsoft, Facebook, and Apple, they're just vehicles through which these geniuses channel their creative will to be, right? And it's, that is what we think is the essence of innovation. The will or volition to perdure, to go beyond circumstances that are quite complicated uh, and to transcend, rather than to create a new type of software for the fact of creating software. Um, in our battered industry these days, we are consistently bombarded with new and supposedly innovative technologies that promise to save us from ruin. We've heard this constantly. We have become slaves of these jargony concepts that force us to pay, to keep up with the competition, and we buy into these supposedly silver bullets, as we have up there, constantly. And then we're told to invest all our capital, but even more importantly, our energy in oftentimes uneconomical solutions. And much of this only to our detriment because what we're actually doing by jumping headfirst into these technological revolutions without analyzing what's going on is really to accelerate the transition that forks over our revenue streams to either the newest startup that is unprofitable or one of the big technology players that have come to dominate the scene um, and that are continuously eating a larger chunk of our advertising pie. In Latin America, innovation is not a mandate of the board of directors, but it's an absolute necessity to survive. At Editorial Perfil, the largest magazine publisher in Argentina, and also the second largest in Brazil, we've come up with a digital model that has allowed us to double digital revenues over the past two years, despite 40% inflation and an economy in recession. And we plan to do that again this year. We took aggressive steps to refresh our technology suite. We designed our own proprietary CMS, and launched a programmatic co-op or a unit of companies to fight against uh, Google and Facebook and the programmatic uh, area. And these things, as I said before, are part of our necessity to survive. Uh, beyond that, we also plan to launch a radio and two open-air TV channels in the next 12 months to continue to solidify our position in the market. But before going into the digital elements, I want to take a second and give you a quick recap of uh, who we are and what Editorial Perfil is, because I'm sure that most of you are not aware. I'll try to be brief. Um, Editorial Perfil was born out of the will to be of Alberto Fontevecchia, my grandfather, who in his early 20s bought a linotype factory that, where he worked at from the original owners. And then he went on to publish football magazines for his beloved San Lorenzo, which is the same team followed by a certain Francis that I'm sure some of you will know. And in 1976, alongside his son, or my father, Jorge, they launched Editorial Perfil, uh, a magazine publisher focused on lowbrow TV mag uh, titles, when at the time in Argentina, you had a monopoly situation in the magazine market with Editorial Atlantida essentially owning everything from circulation and distribution to the ad markets. And we were just about to enter one of the most tumultuous moments in uh, South American history, and Argentine specifically, with all of the military dictatorships that took over the, the continent. Um, so that is when Perfil began to innovate, originally. Uh, the idea was subject matter. We tried to provoke. So that's what the first way in which you try to generate circulation was to provoke, and that was the uh, main revenue stream at the time. And paradoxically, that drew the attention of the good crowd and the wrong crowd. Circulation grew dramatically, but so did attention by the military dictatorship, who first decided to close down our newsroom uh, and then kidnap Jorge, which uh, fortunately he was let go and told to sit tight and 
not bother anybody anymore, which he did for a while until the coming of the Malvinas Falcon Islands War, in which he couldn't with uh, his instinct, and he published a story by an American journalist saying that Argentina would lose the war, to which he was uh, followed after again by a dictatorship, and he escaped in the trunk of a car, uh, luckily, if not, I wouldn't be here. Uh, that's a picture of uh, sort of the Falcon Malvinas Islands War. A few years later, the return of democracy allowed Jorge to return triumphantly to Argentina, and his magazines were now a success. He actually gained celebrity in a way within the publishers because of that. Uh, and so the magazine that sort of took off and allowed us to begin to build was La Semana. So those are from the mid-'80s. That's Alfonsín, the first democratic president after the dictatorship in Argentina. Um, once he returned to Argentina, he came full of ideas from New York, and he launched two highly successful, successful products that remain to today some of the most successful in their area. One of them was Noticias, a sort of Latin American Der Spiegel uh, that became a commercial success due to its investigative stories and provocative covers, again. Um, and Noticias became the highest circulation um, news magazine in the Spanish language. It might still be today. I'm not sure if that's uh, still the case. And we also launched Caras, which is a, a sort of uh, Argentine version of Hello or Hola magazine. And with Caras, we modernized that whole market and ate up half of the market share in Argentina because there was only one magazine in the place, which was Gente by Editor Atlantida. So by the early 1990s, these disruptive models brought by um, copying and imitating things we saw in the rest of the world uh, allowed us to not only compete, but then overtake Atlantida and become the number one magazine publishers of Argentina. An innovation that occurred at that point was uh, we saw, or Jorge, my father, saw that there was opportunity in Brazil. As you may know here, the ad market in Brazil is one of the largest in the world. So he actually took Caras over to Brazil, and it is today the largest celebrity magazine in the Portuguese language, and it's uh, edited in six countries. The genius of Caras was being able to break the stronghold that Globo had on their TV stars. So Brazil is all about telenovelas. But what Globo would do with the telenovela stars is that they would put them in the freezer after they got big and famous so that they would control pay. Where we came in is that we put the telenovela stars in the cover of the magazine. So it ended up breaking Globo's stronghold and it created a new kind of star system in Brazil that at the time didn't exist. It was only part of uh, the soccer world. Um, alongside with this, we broke, into, we broke them into mega stardom and we grew dramatically. And so we launched the Isla de Caras. So that right there is an island that we have in Angra do Rey, and we take celebrities there for photo shoots and pampering, and that took it to the whole other level because the whole aspirational element now fully solidified or came full circle as people would go to Angra do Rey to see the Caras Island from far away, and it's become sort of a cultural phenomenon. As I said, Caras is now the market leader in Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Portugal, and Angola, and it's a huge commercial success. Um, going back to Argentina, and that's, that's a, a German company, uh, and with the power and the commercial success that we had in uh, Brazil, we decided to launch a newspaper in Argentina. So we bought a KBA coining mach machine um, in dollars in 1998. So it's the most uh, modern machine in Argentina, pretty much. Yet three years later, there was the biggest sovereign default in the history of economics, which occurred in Argentina until now, I believe. Greece might have been bigger. But so the market wasn't there at all, and we crashed really hard with this. Uh, trying to launch a newspaper on the verge of the 21st century was an was a ambitious plan, but the economic apocalypse forced, forced us to fold and dug in. After the apocalypse, and I'm almost done with my historical lesson, and I'll get to the digital innovation side, uh, the Kirchners took over power in Argentina. And because we had a particular type of political and independent journalism, we were amongst the main people targeted by them in their new style of um, Latin American populism. So they systematically attacked us from the first day. And what they did is that they used official advertising budgets to buy complacency. And with this, they created a host of, let's call it vampire companies that were living off of the government uh, only to say good things about the government and bad things about those opposing the government. 
Um, so what this does is it gives your competition revenue streams that you don't have, and they're not based on circulation. They're purely based on your political af affinity. So we remained with our model of independent journalism, and we relaunched our newspaper. And the innovation this time, it was only a Sunday newspaper, and then a Saturday-Sunday newspaper. Why? Because most newspapers at the time, and probably today as well, lost money from Monday to Friday only to make it up Saturdays and Sundays. So by concentrating there and by having the financial backup of our Brazilian operations, we managed to withstand the onslaught of the Kirchner administration. And even furthermore, uh, because our readership began to grow, as we were the only ones publishing cases of corruption in the country, uh, we went to court with the government and we sued them for discrimination. Uh, we went all the way to the Supreme Court and we won. And when we won, they didn't publish a single advertisement for years. Eventually, they published one little one that said, see, you finally got it. And then we went to the courts again. And after that, they were forced to begin to distribute the official advertising according to circulation. Um, OK, so that's kind of where Perfil stands today. So sorry for, so that's the other Perfil for all the history lesson. Um, Let's get to the interesting stuff. So, Editorial Perfil today counts with about 20 million unique visitors distributed between Brazil and Argentina. Uh, and our operations in both countries are profitable. In Buenos Aires, where I'm based, we run 17 sites that are growing in audience and in revenue, and we use the same legacy editorial and commercial teams that run the print products. Uh, these are supported by a digital team that acts in a way like in-house consultants. So in the face of Brazil's worst economic crisis in decades, as some of you may know, and Argentina that is locked in an inflationary recession, our digital businesses are stronger than ever. That's our new newsroom in Buenos Aires, which is the largest integrated newsroom in all of South America. Um, so what happened? About five years ago, and after spending millions on loss generating digital operations, which was a mandate of the board of directors, we decided to start from scratch. Our intention was to stop giving money away to software producers that charge us for every minor development, only to take this and give it away to our competition for less money even. And so we developed our own proprietary CMS. And while our intention is not to become a technology company, we're in control of an important part of our core technology, which is now customizable and scalable to our needs. At the same time, our CMS, once we take it to where we want it to be, will be able to generate additional revenue streams for us as we're going to begin to go out and uh, offer it as a service to other uh, companies in, inside Argentina and around the continent. In video, we took a similar approach. What we realized is that when we sat down and did the numbers, they didn't work. So if you try to scale your video uh, capacities, which we could very easily do simply by putting more videos with a scroll to play uh, capacity in more of our pages, we would run up against CDN costs that were prohibitive. And every time you went to a different provider, they would still offer things that didn't work. The, the proposals didn't make sense. You couldn't scale it, or the roof at which you would hit your revenues was too, too low. So it was dedicating a lot of energy to either lose money or not win almost anything. So instead of that, we decided that we're not going to lose any more money on platforms that don't work or on products that we're told that we have to uh, be at. So we put a bunch of different providers to compete with each other. And we're running two different video platforms at the same time. None of them have upfront costs for us. And in all of them, we operate under revenue share uh, conditions. At the same time, and with our ad server company, which is ePlanning, which is a Latin American company, we are developing a proprietary video platform, which is also a necessity of the smaller uh, companies across the Americas and in Argentina, which we're going to go ahead and offer along with our CMS as one of our um, offerings and services at the time. We could say something similar about video content. What we realized is that the cost of generating good content in-house was too expensive. Our teams weren't sophisticated enough. The time it took to edit it wasn't, we didn't really have it. So what we're doing is we're partnering with independent producers across the country to bring on our platform. So we're becoming a platform distribution channel. And then what we're doing is that we're not paying for any of that content. Rather, we're getting advertisers to pay for it, and we split the cost with the producers. In a way, trying to become a sort of TV channel rather than, or digital TV channel. Um, 
In terms of sales, is our commercial strategy. Um, in terms of sales, we didn't seek to reinvent the wheel, but to empower our traditional teams with all the tools they needed. So it's easy to talk about digital and go ahead and say, oh, you need a team that works in digital and you sell this and, and you train. But when you have a traditional legacy organization and you're supposed to be working within that, uh, you, and that's where you're making the majority of your revenues, you need to train those people and you need to make those people sell everything. So you can't simply hire new people and have a new team because the cost structure doesn't, doesn't work. So what we figured out is that we developed a hybrid structure where we have a digital manager responsible for sales with a team of digital partners. These people work side by side with the sales managers of each of our products. And in doing so, they both commission for those sales and they both have that as their budget. So in other ways, we're not, the digital team does not compete with the print team. The digital team is an addition uh, to the print team. Uh, we support them, and this is one of the most important parts of our strategy, with a special products manager. So we learned about special products with Akaras Island as we brought celebrities and we had to sort of sell what today is called branded advertisement. That's what we were selling at Akaras Island in our print publication. So what we do is that we have a special manager that comes up with sort of additional ideas to extract the most in our negotiations uh, from the clients. And then we have a yield management specialist that both optimizes our inventory and our cost structure, and at the same time offers them a programmatic uh, proposal. So at any moment when one of our executives is going to see a client, what they're doing is that they're offering three different things from a digital perspective. It's a, it's a display proposal, it's a special products proposal, and it's a programmatic proposal. And of course, because we're not competing with our print products, what we actually manage to do is to sell across all different platforms. So we can sell the product, we can sell different magazines or different websites or the combination of magazines and websites. And at the same time, it's display and it's uh, branded content and it's programmatic. Um, speaking of programmatic, or before that, one second, it's important to understand that because the print products generate the vast majority of our revenues, advertisers in Argentina, what they're trying to do is to shift as much of the investment as they can into digital. The easy thing to do would be to say, yes, take over digital. Uh, but we realize that that's not what we have to do. We have to support both of our products. So what we do is that we have to remain vigilant in our annual negotiations, which are held at the highest level, and then bring it down and have the team of managers sort of split up that, that uh, income that you get or the money that comes in. Um, moving over, there's another very, very uh, weird thing about Argentina, and this is very dangerous, but it was, I was talking about before, government advertisement. So in Argentina, uh, the government makes up today in our products approximately 30% of the advertising pie sometimes. So what we've had to do is develop very sophisticated lobbying uh, situations so that we can go and sit with the government officials who we are investigating for corruption at the same time and tell them you have to pay. And when they say no, we say, look, we have a court order that says that you have to pay because this is the way that, that it's supposed to be distributed according to circulation, not according to who you decide to, to buy or sell. So while this is like a very dangerous drug, we are prepared to go and offer them 360 degree offers. So we, we offer events, we offer print, and we offer digital in all sorts of ways, and their hand is forced uh, originally. Another really important thing is programmatic. So we understand that Google and Facebook are one of the biggest enemies. So along with the five other largest uh, uh, publishers of the country, we created RPA. RPA is a company that is uh, a programmatic co-op. So we've taken all of our inventory out of Google, and therefore, if you want to buy anything that is premium in Argentina, you have to come through RPA. And we know that this has worked because we've grown RPA's revenues in the first 12 months in which it's been under operation more than uh, Google has uh, grown in those years, in those months. So this is our way of training the market and teaching them how to live uh, there. Uh, another very important point, and I'll go fast, I'm not sure if, if my time's up. So we understand that Google and Facebook are our biggest competitor, yet that we live in a world of Google and Facebook. So we need to get paid for our content. We understand that. And we also believe that their practices in the advertising market are monopolistic and dangerous. Journalism is a pillar of democracy. 
and the free internet is necessary, and this good journalism is expensive. So together in Argentina, they control 80% of the advertising pie. So what have we done? We sued Google and Facebook for monopolistic practices and for copyright infringement, understanding that they're not gonna pay for content, but with that, we sit them in the negotiating table. And the fact that we're suing them does not mean that we can't work with them. We are doing both. And they don't understand that really, but it's necessary because we understand we have to live in their world, but that we're not gonna let them twist our arm. Um, so I'll go quick to the end, that we understand that there's a fight in Europe as well, and we're eager to know more about it and to join forces, but this is necessary for us. And quickly, just in editorial, and I'll finish in 30 seconds, what we do is that we envision our company as a sort of uh, galaxies of content, all in, this, in a universe of Perfil content. So we have a centralized news website, Perfil, that, is, that gets content from all of our magazines, and that content is published both on Perfil and each of the individual magazines. And in that way, we sort of generate a, a, a transition of our of our audience from our sites to our main site and across all our sites. And we do this with the print uh, teams and with the digital team. But I think my time is up, so I will. Unfortunately, stunning insight into Argentina. Incredible. Well, yes. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you, and sorry. Thank you very much. There's my pity. email if you need it, Agustino at Perfil. The, and how to work with the enemy. No, really, no, really incredible. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions because we are beyond the schedule. Sorry. Yeah? But we can connect with you over lunch? Yes, yes, You're I'll here. be around here and can email me and Lovely. talk about anything. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much.